Welcome to Airplay. I'm Connie Kepfinger, and that was the beautiful melody of Joe Eisen. Thank you for our theme music for Airplay 2020. Tonight, uh, with our monthly series, Determined Women, we will have an even deeper look behind the scenes as we meet the very talented artists who create the work, who make it happen at a core level. Speaking of very talented actors, artists, we welcome my co-host, Christy Donahue. Christy, first let me share our deepest sympathies with you. Christy recently lost her mom, Pat McBennett. Pat was a very, very special mom, creative lady, and she gave her daughter the wonderful gift of reading. She used to read aloud to her every day, right, Christy? Yep. Now you're reading globally to the world every week with us. How wonderful. You know, there's a lot going on, but there's also a lot of creativity happening as well, and we have to honor that talent. So, Christy, tell us about our guest tonight. Well, Nancy Rhodes is a stage director, writer, and educator, and she stages a wide range of musicals, operas, and plays in the USA, Europe, and Asia. She directed The Astronaut's Tale at the Brooklyn Academy of Music, Sam Fisher, staged the world premiere of Tartuffe for San Francisco Opera, and Virgil Thompson's opera, Lord Byron, at Alice Tully Hall. As artistic director and co-founder of Encompass Theater, specializing in new music drama and American opera, she has staged over 65 works, including Gertrude Stein, Virgil Thompson's The Mother of Us All, which is about Susan B. Anthony, Blitz Stein's Regina, Britain's Phaedra, and Only Heaven by Ricky Ian Gordon and Langston Hughes. Her production of The Diary of Anne Frank was nominated for an Artistic Achievement Award and played to over 4,000 people on tour at Cleveland Opera. She recently directed the world premiere of Anna Christie, based on a Pulitzer Prize-winning play by Eugene O'Neill, and the cast album was released by Broadway Records in 2019 and reached number six on the Billboard charts. Internationally, she directed Death in Venice, Stockholm, Carmen, Oslo, Happy End, Finland, Kiss Me Kate, and Kara Film for TV, West Side Story, Istanbul, and Eccentrics, Outcasts, and Visionaries for the Holland Festival in Amsterdam, and the first American musicals ever staged in the country of Albania. At Encompass, she launched Paradigm Shifts Music and Film Festival to celebrate courageous people around the world protecting our planet, oceans, and wildlife. And in 2017, Paradigm Shifts was presented in Seoul, Korea. As Vice President, U.S. Delegate to the International Theatre Institute, Rhodes conducted workshops and served as a guest speaker in Italy, Sweden, Germany, Venezuela, Argentina, Korea, Holland, Russia, and the Czech Republic, and Estonia. She taught acting for singers at Manhattan School of Music for 12 years and is the commissioned librettist of the theory of everything, inspired by physics string theory of multiple dimensions and alternate universes. Wow, 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 wow. What a legacy, a legend, and truly a determined woman of the stage. <laughs> Join me in welcoming Nancy Rhodes. Welcome, Nancy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. You're certainly a Renaissance woman. <laughs> it's wild. I mean, you've done it all basically. So tell us, let's get started with this interview and talk about what brought you into the world of theater. It's a pretty wild place. So tell us, you've done so much. How did it start? Well, you know, I was thinking about this and you generated a memory that I had long forgotten. And I remembered it uh, uh, for tonight. And it was 
going back in time to when I was 11 years old in the sixth grade, and we had some theater things we were doing, and I was given a monologue, uh, which I memorized. And it was about a homeless lady uh, who was all alone in a snowstorm. And, you know, you get up in front of the class, and if you remember those desks with the ink wells in, and so all my classmates were seated, and I began to tell and be this woman. And at one point, I lifted my hand to uh, catch a snowflake, um, and I felt the loneliness and the sadness of this woman. And as I was speaking, I suddenly felt the whole energy of the room uh, begin to tingle and shift. And as I looked out, I saw my classmates crying. They were weeping. And it was such a, I guess you would say, a kind of sacred moment. It was so tender and so fragile. And I, um, I felt the power of that in that moment. And yet, simultaneously, I did feel at my young age the responsibility that it took to, to do this. Um, and then, as I thought, I said, you know, that was the day that I understood and experienced the theater in my heart wow. and with the rest of the people that I was uh, expressing. And so I think that was the true beginning um, for me as a young person. It is. It's a very magical experience, the creative moment, because you're on the moment but you got to know the future. you got to know where you're going next. And that is such a revelation because you're in the moment, but you're going forward. You can feel yourself going forward, and you know when you're not. So it's really, really powerful. That's a wonderful experience, 11 years old. No wonder. So then what came next? What came next? Well, you know, I was one of those kids that I grew up in a musical community uh, and family. My father played the trombone uh, and the piano, and my aunt was an uh, organist and pianist, and I started playing music when I uh, on the piano when I was five and wow. sang in little groups. So music was a big part of my life. And another part of my life was growing up in a rural community in Pennsylvania, where, uh, where I spent uh, Chambersburg, near Gettysburg. Okay. okay. And so I grew up, I had, uh, on my mother's side, Mennonite farmers, and they were very close to the land, and I've always been sustained and um, nourished by nature. So it's taught me so much. Um, so then I... Um, when I was about 14, I, I uh, got involved with the community theater, and I got cast to play Kim McAfee in Bye Bye Birdie, if you can imagine. And then after that, um, uh, there was a summer theater called Totem Pole Playhouse, which still exists. It's one of the oldest summer theaters in the country. Uh, and Jean Stapleton from All in the Family. Oh, yeah. Yes, well, she yeah. and her husband founded this theater, so oh, I became... Oh. I you became a local her? jobber. You work with worked her? On... Yes, yes. Oh well, my I was 16. I love her. She's amazing. <laughs> yeah. They say, so, people say, I, I've never met, but I, they say that she was like a phenomenal lady of the stage, like live. She, she, I remember I was, uh, before I got a, a local jobber, I was an usher. I think I saw Oklahoma 14 times uh, as an usher. So you kind of learn uh, very quickly about the theater if you're watching it every night. So uh, that was really shaped uh, my roots. And then, you know, like everybody or many people, I went on to college uh, in Ohio University. And then I came to New York City to really uh, begin my, my career. Um, which, uh, you know, a few stops along the way. But then I went, um, I started up with uh, a directing program at NYU. And during that time, I got my first theater job at the Roundabout Theater. Oh, wow. And, first job. Well, yes. And, uh, and, and, you know, I was paid $50 a week. That's and wild. I thought that I had hit the jackpot. I mean, I thought Absolutely. that was the... <laughs> Absolutely. And I had such a great experience there. Um, 
working as, well, I did everything, but I was assistant director, I was stage manager, I did props, I did, you know, everything. And I worked with Victor Garber and Beatrice Strait uh, in the great Ibsen play Ghosts and oh, many, yeah. many other people. Um, but, um, and um, was mentored by Gene Feist, who founded uh, the Roundabout Theater, gave me my first directing jobs uh, to, to direct some shows for the subscribers. And I was then able to join the director's union as a result of that. So I, you know, in thinking about this this evening, I realized how important relationships are throughout life, throughout career. It's all about your friendships, your colleagueships. Uh, so but the next big turning point came when I got a little postcard that said uh, that uh, this company was advertising for a director for a play by Gertrude Stein called The Mother of Us All. And I don't know, I picked up that card, and I think it started to vibrate, and I, I, I said, I, I'm sure. going to get this job. Well, lo and behold, amazingly enough, I don't know how really, but I did get the job. So a few days went by, and the phone rang, and the uh, producer said, oh my goodness, we made a terrible mistake. <laughs> we thought it was a play by Gertrude Stein, but it turns out it's an opera. And he said, what are you going to do? And I was like, you know, that moment where I really need this job. I really oh, need, this job. I need this job. <laughs> yeah, so, so I said, uh, I don't know where this came from. I said to him, I'll make an adaptation. And I said, and he said, okay, good. And I said, I will need a music director. And he said, okay, good, good. So I was happy about this. And the next day I went to the roundabout and I told my friend who was the music director at the roundabout the whole story. And he said, Nancy, are you crazy? You can't make an adaptation of a classic masterpiece by Gertrude Stein and Virgil Thompson. And you have, he said, you have to go talk to Virgil Thompson. And I was like, oh my gosh. He said, well, he lives in the Chelsea Hotel and roundabout at that time was on 26th Street and 8th Avenue. So I very nervously picked up the phone and called Mr. Thompson, and I'll never forget his voice. He sort of screamed through the phone, and he said, come on over. So I went over, and I was sort of in my bohemian days, so I had a Chinese jacket and platform shoes and a long skirt, and I appeared and knocked on his door, and he swung it open, and uh, the two of us broke into laughter. Uh, just cracked up. Anyway, he ushered me in. I sat down. I got right to it. I said, Mr. Thompson, I'm going to, I need to make an adaptation because we only have actors. <laughs> it's an opera. Anyway, I told him my ideas. And here is the defining moment. He said, yes. And then I said something else. And he said, yes. And he said, good ideas. Yes. And then he got up, he went over to the piano, he began to play and sing. And by this time, I knew the score, so I started singing with him. And we were off to the races. Mm -hmm. And then he said, would you like a glass of sherry? And I said, yes, I would. Yes. Cool. <laughs> so that began a 12-year, 14-year period of a long friendship, mentorship, uh, by Virgil Thompson. We went on to do the production. It was a great success. Um, and it, uh, it got a terrific review in the New York Times and uh, designated as one of the best productions of 1976. Anyway, it launched Encompass New Opera Theater. At that time, we called it Encompass Music Theater because we do both. Yeah. So it launched our company, which still exists, uh, from to this day, and um, so Virgil was a, a, a huge backbone, and Gertrude Stein. Um, and I might just say, you know, Virgil Thompson uh, was uh, worked with John Hausman, 
Orson Welles. He was in Gertrude Stein and uh, Salon in Paris. He knew all of the famous artists, Alice B. Toklas. He wrote two operas, three actually, with Gertrude. Uh, another landmark, uh, Four Saints in Three Acts, which, by the way, was the first opera ever produced on Broadway in 1930 with an all-African-American cast, nice. a female set designer, and the, uh, the, the, the sets were made of cellophane and all sorts of beautiful... If you ever get a chance, look at the photographs. It was a landmark. Okay. Uh, production, it would still be avant-garde and a landmark if it were done exactly that way today. So that's a little bit about... Um, you know, those were the days where creativity, there was no limit. You know, it's like Ping Chang doing things with tons of, you know, 50 pound of feathers and... <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah, you know, and I worked with, um, I had a play done a couple of years ago with Tisa Chang, and I thought to myself, well, wow, it's a legacy, you know, of uh, the Pan-Asian Repertory Theater, and just, you know, your roots, your roots are like right there, you know. I, I had the pleasure of working with two men that were in Albee's original playwrights unit, so oh, wow. it, it was really exciting to, to, and when you feel those roots, you, it's, you're in awe, you're in awe with those people, but, but then you feel yourself growing, and somehow you come of age, so, so Encompass Theater was born, and t for just for the audience's sake, what's the difference between musical theater and opera? Tell our listeners. Well, you know, we re I really use the term music theater mm -hmm. or music drama. Okay. So it, um, since we have focused on the one thing that Encompass has done that's different from regular opera companies, we have focused on 20th and 21st century American multicultural artists, singers, composers. So we're all of our works, um, with maybe one exception, are sung in are in English, okay. uh, by American writers on American themes uh, with um, American artists. Oh, cool, cool, cool. Yeah. So, uh, for example, we worked. Our second production was *The Tenderland* by Aaron Copland. Uh, he came to our theater. We worked with him. Um, we Our first big, second big hit, I should say, was Regina by Mark Blitzstein, you know, who wrote the translation of Three Penny Opera by, uh, and New Kurt Vile. Yes. And uh, Regina is based on Lillian Hellman's The Little Foxes. Oh, wow. Uh, another great, great play. Of one, I would love to direct that again uh, because it has a... a powerful theme for today of the environment and greed taking over as through this one family. Um, yeah, so we, uh, we had a, 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 during those years a workshop for uh, called First Stage First, um, and we did new works um, by living composers, and they would come to the workshop once a week, and then at the end of the season, we would uh, put their, their pieces up on... Uh, we were working in so the theater. So this started in New York City, is that correct? Yes. And yes. Where, whereabouts? Uh, well, our first production was at, in West Beth. Okay. Uh, oh, okay, yeah. Right through the yes. Couple. And then the big, the big uh, mother of us all we did at the Church of the Good Shepherd uh, okay. on 65th Street, right behind um, uh, Juilliard. Okay. And then we... Uh, a man came to see that, and he came backstage and said, do you people need a theater? And we said, well, yes, we do. <laughs> he, said, yeah. He, yeah. he said, I happen to have a, a space on 48th Street between 7th and 8th. He said, would you like to see it? And we said, yes. And so we were there for seven years. We were up above a peep show oh, man. and <laughs> underneath a karate studio. Oh, and, there, and there we made... Beautiful music and theater. Beverly Sills came. Tony, <laughs> all sorts of people. Came. You know th those kind of stories that they just really amaze you how things are given to you. Like you said, that job of directing just came right to you, and then the building. You know the, the you know that old saying: if you build it, 
It will come. If the universe, if you're walking the right path, I believe, things will come to you. You'll meet the right people. And that's how I met you through that league. You know, all of a sudden we're talking, we're in a meeting, and there you are running for office. And she's running for office for the <laughs> League of Professional Women's Theater. I mean, you just don't stop. It's great. It's fantastic. But let's talk a little bit about your international work. How did that start? Because that's exciting. To I mean, you were obviously global before it was now, you know, I mean, doing things all over the place. Well, at that time, I had not ever been outside of the country. But here again, Virgil Thompson did me a good deed. So he was asked who could put together a program of American opera for the Holland Festival in Amsterdam. Wow. And he said, Nancy Rhodes and Encompass Music Theater. And so um, he opened this door that, you know, I give thanks every day, uh, Connie, honestly, because it, it, it was such a gift. Uh, and I go back to that simple word that he said, yes. yes. How important. Yes. It and, is. And, and you said the vibration, you know, that's important too. Like when, when we connect with somebody and we know somebody, you know, I mean, I've had mentors come into my life at just the right time, you know? And so, so he, uh, so he asked you to go to the Holland festival and yes. So they, so I put together, um, with the team of singers from here and, um, uh, dancers and um, orchestra from Holland and a principal singer from Holland. And um, I called it, uh, I titled the program, Eccentrics, Outcasts, and Visionaries, comma, A Century of American Opera. Because in fact, these writers were eccentric. Many of them were outcasts and, and many of them uh, worked and struggled uh, to to put their vision across. So sure. we had many, many, we had 16 or 17 fully staged scenes, uh, including uh, Scott Joplin's Tremonisha and um, many other works. And they uh, played in a big theater in Amsterdam. And then we had the smaller production that toured uh, four cities in the Netherlands. So we got to travel around so that was your first overseas. That was the first time. Oh, and let me just share this. Okay. When I was nine years old, my grandfather that I love so much um, got had a stroke. And I came home from school and there he was lying on the sofa. And in that day and age, they didn't let um, little kids go to the hospital. So he went, they took him off to the hospital. They wouldn't let me visit, which was devastating to me. Um, and uh, he ultimately passed away. Uh -huh. So um, then it was during a period where I, you know, I was afraid to turn the light out at night. I had all sorts of uh, scary things going on in my consciousness. But I had a dream. I had a night dream. And I dreamed that I walked across the ocean and the water only came up to my knees. And so the first country that I went to had windmills. Yeah. And, <laughs> and then the next country had a great big pretzel that they gave me. And then I went to another. And when I woke up, I was so happy. It was some kind of a sustaining uh, dream. And of course, those many years later, the first country that I went to had windmills. Yeah, yeah. Was, so, you know, I, I take the, um, our dreams, our fears, our scary moments. It's all the, it's all what we work with as artists and we can transform it. We can go into it and face it, um, and write about it as you do. Um, yeah. and, um, this is the, the stuff of our work, isn't it? It is. It is. It's funny because I have a play called Coffee House Magic where the oh. um, the the fellow's in a coffee shop. He's a uh, he's actually a physicist and he's a playwright. And his actual dreamweaver comes to see him from his dream and talks to him about 
you know, what are dreams? Dreams are aspirations and they're the aspirations of life. So I know exactly what you're talking about with that. So, oh, that um, sounds wonderful. We'll have to talk about that. Yeah, we'll talk afterwards. about that. We'll talk about that. <laughs> but, um, uh, but let's talk more about you now. Now, when you start a company, this is exciting to me because I, I had a small theater company in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania back in the 80s and it was a women's theater company and I did solely women's work. I uh, worked uh, under the auspices of a women's center and so I fortunately I had all the different availabilities for space as well at a university. But when you start a company like this, and this is to me, this I've not talked to anybody, I've talked to a lot of different people that have started companies, but you have a vision. What, how do you describe, how do you feel? I mean, I know as a writer what my whole thing started. Tell the audience how your vision started and how you started forming it. Like, how does it form? And I'm sure, you know, like, just share with us some of that. Well, I think that's a, that's a really, really good question. You know, I think um, I, I was always attracted to the great writers, um, of I, at, when I worked at the roundabout, I thought I would be directing classical plays of the world theater. Um, so I, I'm always interested in uh, pieces that examine what it is to be human. What is wh why are we here? What are we doing? What's the relationship? Uh, who has the power? Uh, what? Um, what drives us to do the things that we do? How can we um, walk through conflict and transform? So all of these things um, interest and um, fascinate me. I, I feel sometimes that I'm really more of a, a scientist uh, studying the human spirit. Uh, the human, oh, that's uh, a good way. And I just happen to use theater as the platform, but... Um, you know, studying what makes us tick and why we do the things we do. and Architect and so soul. Architect, oh, that's beautiful. Oh, I like that, yes. You had mentioned the play, you had mentioned the play Ghosts. And yes. uh, uh, I, I'll never forget, I saw that many, many years ago at um, ART, directed by Robert Brewstein. And at the very end, they use a light out, a white out instead of a blackout because of the sun that was coming on, oh. bit, you know, the sun who was getting blinded by syphilis. And so, you know, that, that's, that's what I love about theater. The fact that we can put all these things together and connect the dots and connect the lines. And then all of a sudden something magical happens and that's when it's transcendent. So you're absolutely, you know, um, that's, that's so cool, you know, but so and you're, well, I, the other thing I might add is that I've always been interested in the what is unseen. So I'll give you another story. <laughs> when I was growing up, there was um, outside my bedroom window, there was uh, a young, uh, young man. He was probably a, a teenager. And he, back then, if you had certain um, disabilities, they didn't take you outside. You, he was hidden away, and his name was Sonny. And I wanted to, I wanted to talk to him. I wanted to be with him. And his mother would never uh, allow it. But I would hear him singing out the window, and he would sing, "Jesus loves me, yes I know." Mm -hmm. And I would only see his shadow, and I would hear this voice. And it's so haunting to this day. I can't, um, I can't let go of these, of this thought. So, so the unseen or the voiceless or those who are hidden in the shadows. Um, this, this, this interests me as a, as a theater person, as a director, as a writer. Uh, I want to know. I want to explore um, these, these parts of ourselves that we keep in the shadows. Yeah, that's great. And it's interesting because people want to go further with the mental 
And it doesn't, you know, it is the unseen, you know, you can see with your heart, you know, and that's yes. the exciting thing. And I, I wrote this, I was asked to um, do a little piece with Theater in Exile, and I wrote a monologue and did a collaboration. I always work with music, and I worked with my friend James, and we put together this little piece, um, and... Uh, they're, they're doing this thing called climbing the wall. So it's just the experience of now. And during writing just a small monologue, I came to the revelation that wearing a mask, we can't share smiles. Mm. And I thought to myself, wow. You know, and it's such, mm. a, it's such a, a wild thing, you know. It's like we took that for granted for years, you know, like that we can touch and that we can, you know. And... Um, I don't know. I, you know, I wrote a play in 96 about not being able to touch anymore, that, that the germicidal levels would be too high. You know, mm. where does that come from? That's unseen. It just comes to you, you know? So, well, and you mentioned also that you had worked with the women, uh, women's theater. Yes. And um, I wanted to mention that the first, first job I had, even before the roundabout, was with the West Beth Playwrights Feminist Collective. And um, so they hired me, and uh, we did uh, a version of The Mother of Us All there before we did the big one. That oh, involved. cool. But, you know, I wanted also to give, because uh, there may be some people from the League of Professional Theater Women, uh, you know, I worked uh, Martha Kwanye, the great Martha Kwanye of the International Theater Institute. Uh, she was my boss for 25 years, because uh, she made it possible, of course, I had to get elected, but she made it possible for me to be the vice president of the music theater uh, division of the International Theater Institute, uh, which I served for 25 years. And many of those years were during the last, um, well, the last 10 years of the Cold War. So I went to Eastern Bloc countries uh, and then two years later to um, Western and back and forth. So it was quite a very, very interesting time politically and socially to be in the Soviet Union and to be in Czechoslovakia before it became the Czech Republic and, um, and, and some of the other Eastern countries, Estonia, for example. Mm -hmm. So, But uh, Martha Kwanye is one of the great champions, one of the great women uh, heroines of, uh, of the theater and the international global theater in the United States. So um, she, is, she is somebody I wanted to especially um, recognize and oh. thank. Yeah, and it's interesting when you talk about meeting people and knowing people and when these things come together, it's just like it's meant to be and you feel it. You feel it. So that is unseen. It's not, it's not, it's not matter. You know, it's not a, a board. It's, you know. So tell me, though, what of all the things that you've done, how many countries have you been in? Like, just off the top of your head, 20, 30, 40? Oh, well, not, maybe, maybe 20 or so. Okay. okay. So of all that traveling, and all the things that you did in the in the village and in, in uh, West Beth, starting then, what is your fondest memory? Wow! So that's a, you know that's sort of like which child do I? Uh, you know, I was I thought you might ask that. You know, I I I, I had really certainly Virgil, which you've already heard about. Uh, I have to say, working and meet, working, meeting and working with Estelle Parsons, um, because wow. in 1982 we did a piece called Elizabeth and Essex, based on a play by Maxwell Anderson, although it was musicalized, and we called up Estelle and invited her to play Queen Elizabeth, and she said yes, oh, and so um, I had the incredible fear and exhilaration of directing Estelle Parsons, mm -hmm. uh, you know, one of the great uh, um, um, actresses, I think, of our century. And um, I, um, it, it, so we've become friends. And, and um, in January of 2020, we honored Estelle at our musical salute gala. 
along with Maury Yeston, who wrote the, the composer who wrote Titanic. We honored the, the both of them, and we did uh, musical selections from the shows that he wrote and the shows she was in. Did you know that Estelle was in the original production of Three Penny Opera in no. the United States oh, with, that. with La Telenia? Oh, my she God. Played opposite oh. La Telenia at the Theater de Lille. Um, oh, wow. And um, she did. She did a number of um, operas and musicals, and uh, certainly played Elizabeth in Essex. She was a, an extraordinary um, artist to work with because it's so fiercely intelligent, uh, unafraid, goes fully one hundred percent into what she is called upon to do without fear. Uh, goes 100%, 150%. And it was just, uh, I learned just from being in the same room with her. Oh, sure. Oh, sure. There are people that you just absorb it, you know. I remember one of my biggest moments in playwriting, I was hanging wallpaper with uh, Eddie Evans, who was uh, part of all these original playwrights group and and we we just started talking about things and he and uh glenn gress his partner they had a um little costume shop as a, another side venue and he was telling me how barbara streisand came into them and says okay i got an audition i need two dresses they gotta look like this one's this one's this i have 19 dollars. so do something <laughs> you know, and that's how people get started because when you have that drive which puts me right in to the next level. What kind of advice can you give people that are starting, not just, not just young people, not just college students, everybody that is in a period of stasis that is feeling like they need to go further. What advice could you give them? We talk about this um, emerging playwright, emerging artist, emerging actor career mid-career you know what does that mean to you what does like what would you you said something to me and i'm not gonna um bring that up because that brought up a lot of emotion for me but just the whole idea of understanding that artist spirit waiting to fly off the tree you know it's like what kind of advice could you give anybody that's in that state well, I mean, if the, if the truth be told, I feel like I'm in that state all the time. <laughs> in other words, you know, every minute of every day, sometimes you, you, you question, you wonder, is it this, is it that, what am I doing, why? Um, I do believe that um, inner reflection, uh, meditation, um, um, being in close contact with other artists to exchange ideas. I mean, ultimately, it comes down to trust in yourself, but that's a big order. Yeah. Uh, it's not easy to trust oneself, and I think we, we live a lifetime trying to do that, uh, believing in yourself. So I say stay around people who say yes Yes and yes. yes. Stay away from those who say no. You'll never do that. All of the green meanies, I call it. Just stay away from it. You don't have uh, the energy for that. No. Align yourself with people. Spend time in nature. Listen. Observe. Be quiet. Uh, meditate. Pray. Uh, open yourself to mystics throughout the generations. Read inspirational work. Um, believe in the little tiny voice that you hear inside. Go with it. Trust it. Make theater or music or poetry in any and every, wherever it is. It doesn't have to be the Paris Opera. Do it uh, right next door at your church or synagogue or mosque or wherever it is. Just express yourself. Um, we need we need all the expression, the voices, uh, the beauty and truth. We need it. The world is hungry. Absolutely, Absolutely. hungry for the soul. As you said, absolutely. We we actually if 
And the thing is, if we're not creative, we'll be destructive, right? I mean, we have to be creative where we were created or born or somehow connected to nature and creation, to what's around us. And we, in order to be in with it, we need to keep going with it. So I, I'm with you 100, 150%. And that's <laughs> wonderful advice because it's not about you know, do this by the time you're 20 and do this by the time you're 30 and, you know, well, make sure you do this and make sure that, you know, it's, that's such a hard way to live. You know, it's a hard way to understand the world around you, you know, but your advice is wonderful. And I, you know, I hope people hear you out there because it gives hope. It certainly gives hope. And especially at this time, this time, yeah. we're all sitting here going, okay, what's next? <laughs> Well, I mean, uh, you know, life is one big adventure. Absolutely. But, you know, time time is eternal. Mm-hmm. Life is eternal. There is life after life where, you know, everyone has their own concept about that. Okay. Um, but um, there is enough time. I know so many um, incredibly uh, vigorous people working uh, well into their 90s. I mean, performing, uh, running around, singing, speaking, doing all sorts of well, well, well into their 90s. So um, there's a lot of possibility there. Um, I just want to throw out two things that I'm working on now. Okay, cool. I'm just going to ask. <laughs> Next. All right. Next. So there's a piece that I wrote. It's called The Theory of Everything. Uh-huh. Um, uh, I wrote the libretto, and John David Ernest, a composer, wrote the music. Um, it's, a, it's a piece that we worked on. We were commissioned, and uh, it's now ready to go. Uh, and it involves a quantum physicist from Brazil, and his uh, partner, uh, who is his wife, who is a, um, uh, a uh, documentary filmmaker studying near-death experiences, and their eight-year-old child, who's a precocious uh, student of astronomy. And he's Brazilian, raised in the Amazon, and she's from New York, and they uh, have come together together. Um, things happen and they're each on a sort of journey of discovery Uh, something tragic happens that spurs them to deeper and the last scene takes place in the top of the Andes mountains in Peru uh, with the Caro uh, elders in the tribe and some transformative things happen along the way so um I'm, I'm, I'm praying this be, I'm praying that we get this on, you know, with all of the uncertainty that you talked about. Well, where but, is that? Where are you doing this? Where are you, where well, are you we, uh, uh, there's another company, um, a music company, Trinity uh, Music, uh, uh, Trinity Music Wall Street, that are hopefully, they were planning to do it with us, but everyone is now uncertain as right. to time mm-hmm. and so forth. But that that is the, the plan, uh, the wonderful conductor, uh, Julian Wachner, uh, who worked with us on Adam Christie, by the way. Oh, he, cool. did the, he was the conductor oh, music cool. director for that. Yeah. Well, how did you get the idea for this? You said it was a commission for... Well, um, you know, I have... Uh, <laughs> you know, my hats, I have long interest in quantum physics. And my grandfather, the one I mentioned, who, who he oh, taught wow. physics, and I grew up, I grew up with him. Um, but I just have an interest, and I um, started reading about it and, and realizing there's uh, so much that we're just learning now that, uh, that has been an outgrowth of quantum physics that's leading into a greater understanding of the so-called mysterious the spiritual aspects um, and that's really unfolding now. A lot of people are writing, and uh, as you know, uh, and exploring these issues. Um, and so there was a physicist that I particularly um, uh, felt drawn to, and his name is David Bohm, B-O-H-M. Oh, yeah, on creativity. I love him. Yes. That's how, my whole work from Coffeehouse Magic is about him. Oh, well, see, we were, you see, we were meant to come together, yeah. Connie. There's no question about that. And he, well, uh, just so you know, there's a film, a film, a brand new film coming out on um, the 19th of June. I mean, sorry, the 20th. 
of June. I'll send you um, um, a, a, a filmmaker okay. from Pennsylvania where David was from. Um, oh, cool. Yeah, you know what? Who um, introduced me to him was the provost, who was a physics teacher as well, um, Vera Nair. Um, so she she's the one who told me to read David Bohm, and that's how oh. it all came. Oh. So that's exciting. Theory of everything. We'll be looking for it, and we'll be <laughs> looking for Encompass, Encompass New Opera Theater. And welcome again. Wonderful speaking with you, Nancy Rhodes. Oh, thank, thank you, you so honey. much for being on the show tonight. It's an honor to be here. And I'm very, very grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. We'll see you guys next week. Bye-bye. Okay.